Welcome to this short lecture on Oscar Wilde's only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, which came out in 1890 in magazine form, but came out in the version that you'll be more familiar with, um, a longer extended version in 1891. So today's lecture will take you through some of the socio-historical context of the novel and think about its position in the Gothic genre, because there was an explosion of um, the Gothic in the 1890s uh, with texts such as Ryder Haggard She and The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which actually came out in 1886, but it had a massive influence on the picture of Dorian Gray. You've also got novels like um, The Great God Pan um, in 1897 too. So some really um, key texts that came out in the period. And we'll think about the way in which um, Dorian Gray feeds into those as well. So uh, it comes out in a really pivotal moment in British history. Britain is experiencing an economic slowdown in this period. Although by the end of the century, the British Empire covered one quarter of the known world, this was accompanied by uh, an anxiety about imperial hubris, this sense that Britain had got too big for its boots, had taken on too much with this empire. And comparisons were drawn between the British Empire and its ancient Roman predecessor, um, similarly a small state that had gone on to cover um, and conquer um, huge swathes of the known world and had then fallen into decadence and slided into um, decline, both moral and economic, to the sense that the barbarians had then later came over and took over the Roman Empire. And this, um, for Britain, was also covered by um, anxieties about the independence movement in India. India was the jewel in the British crown at the moment. And Britain was also involved with wars, with the Boers in contemporary South Africa too. And um, there was also an influx of Jewish immigrants, of about 10,000 in number, from Russia who were escaping pogroms against them. Also in the period, we see systematic and sustained challenges to Victorian social conventions in the figure of the new woman, uh, a late Victorian feminist, and the aesthete, the uh, late Victorian artist, avant-garde artist. So the new woman was an educated woman who apparently displayed masculine tendencies and invoked anxieties about sterility and failure to reproduce. And she was gender bending because of these masculine qualities that she had. This was also accompanied by anxieties about masculinity as embodied in the figure of the aesthete and the decadent as represented by Oscar Wilde and his uh, fellow artist Aubrey Beardsley. Now these figures were usually male and um, they were poets and artists who were satirised um, in the day for their effeminacy and for their proselytising about beauty. Oscar Wilde was satirised for walking down Piccadilly with a sunflower in his pocket. And their philosophy was of being free and being true to yourself. But of course, his philosophy had a darker side. Being true and free and experiencing everything meant um an encounter with the darker sides of life um drugs for example prostitution uh, criminality and in Wilde's case homosexuality um the period saw in 1885 the criminal law amendment act being put into operation which criminalized acts of gross indecency between men in public and private so if you were discovered um under this law, you were sent to prison for two years. So basically, Oscar Wilde in 1895 was later sent to prison for being homosexual and sent to two years hard labour. And indeed, he only received a posthumous pardon for being homosexual um, in 2017. So how could you explain all these um, so-called problems? How did the Victorians explain these problems back to themselves? Well, there was this theory of degeneration, which was very much in vogue at the moment. Um, there was this sense that as much as Darwinian evolution um, interpreted um, life in terms of progress, evolutionary improvement and development, by the 1880s, these treatments of evolution emphasised that the process could move backwards as well as forwards. There could be a sense of regression, which seemed as likely as progress. British scientists such as Henry Maudsley and Edwin Ray Lancaster stressed that evolution just meant adaptation to the natural environment. Organisms could become simpler 
as well as more complex, humans could regress to the life of their savage ancestors or be vanquished by a superior animal. So here we've got the Neanderthal, this anxiety that man could regress to a more Neanderthal state. And also a picture of Joseph Merrick, um, the elephant man, who's also seen as a figure of physical degeneration, decline and decay rather unfairly. So degeneration was faddish but wildly popular and notably it speaks about the same kinds of things that the Gothic as a genre had always spoken about, which is heredity, um, inheritance, criminality and then later degeneration becomes thematized in late Victorian Gothic. You could argue that degeneration is a scientific counterpart to Gothic fiction. Certainly degeneration theory was as sensationalist as um, the gothic literary genre. So degeneration theories responded to and fed into concerns about racial decline, which Britain was experiencing at the moment, um, focus, and it focused on the atavistic potential of modernity, the city, and rapidly uh, multiplying urban working classes. For conservative cultural chem commentators, the feminist and the homosexual and the decadent artist like Wilde, uh, the madman, the criminal and immigrant and the colonial native were all evidence of degeneracy. So degeneration theory enjoyed considerable influence within the scientific field and underlay the so-called new sciences that had come into being at this period. Um, the new sciences of anthropology, sexology, evolutionary psychology, criminology and eugenics. And these scientists are interesting because they espouse the idea of visible vice, i.e. that visible signs of deviancy could be read in the appearance of the criminal, the savage, the homosexual or the madman. And notably, Dorian is three of these. He is the criminal, the homosexual and one could argue the madman because he dies loathsome and wrinkled of visage. So while his tapping into contemporary scientific theories with his novels. So what are the literary contexts um, of the novel? What are the Gothic elements of it? Well, Dorian engages in a Faustian pact. He sells his soul to the devil in the form of Lord Henry. Now, Faust was a figure from German legend who made a pass with the devil Mephistopheles and then gets everything that he wants but then is thrown into hell at the end as his kind of um, punishment for selling his soul. And this figure of the Faustian Pact had already appeared in British fiction in novels such as uh, Matthew Lewis's The Monk from 1796 and Malmoth the Wanderer written by Oscar Wilde's uncle from 1820. So Dorian sells his soul to the devil, i.e. Lord Henry, in the seduction temptation scene. Lord Henry tells him, as you can see on this quote, the only way of getting rid of a temptation is to yield to it, resist it, and your soul grows sick with longing for the things that it has forbidden itself, with desire for what its monstrous laws have made monstrous and unlawful. And after praising Dorian's beauty and youth, he goes... We degenerate into hideous puppets haunted by the memory of the passions of which we were too much afraid and the exquisite temptations that we had not the courage to yield to. Youth, youth, there is absolutely nothing in the world but youth. And so this philosophy that Henry proposes is very provocative for the Victorian period. His sense that don't let anyone dictate your behaviour to you and that law is just tired convention and something um, that you live in fear of. You're just afraid of the law and you must wring whatever you can out of the experience to know yourself better. So <clears throat> Dorian makes this plea then before his picture. If it were I who was to be always young and the picture that was to grow old, I would give my soul for that. After he abandons Sybil, there's this moment of the fantastic where he wonders where whether the picture has actually changed or not. There's this sense of hesitation. And we're told he started back as if in surprise. One would have said that there was a touch of cruelty in the mouth. It was certainly strange. He rubbed his eyes and came close to the picture and examined it again. There were no signs of any actual changes when he looked into the picture. And yet there was no doubt the whole expression had altered. 
after Sybil's death, he embarks upon a deeply amoral life. And it's all pretty lurid and provocative stuff, things that would have really and did upset the morality of the earnest Victorians. So we see Dorian slide into criminality. We see him brawling in the East End. He pursues sordid seductions of women, both aristocratic and working class women, women who are seduced by Dorian that can't even bear to be uh, in the same room with him after um, they have been seduced by him. And he goes to brothels and we're told at one point that he's thrown out of a brothel in the East End um, because God knows what he had actually asked for there. And there are these litany of reputations that um, of people who are ruined by Dorian that Basil mentions in chapter 12. It's implied that he's seduced men as well as uh, women and with some of the men actually committing suicide, leaving the country and we're told that he smokes opium and he has extreme sexual appetites apparently because of his being banned from East End brothels and this all leads up to this horrible um, career that he has, leads up to the murder of Basil Hallward. Noir's novel bears the influence of uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's um, novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which was written in 1886. And it was written in the wake of the 1885 Criminal Law Amendment Act. Stevenson tells us that repression creates a monstrous other, an uncanny double. Dr. Jekyll is a respectable doctor who, because he represses himself so much, um, creates a monstrous double. Um, which he uses to create, to sort of evade society's dictums. And uh, Mr Hyde um, is a murderer and has implied sexual veracity. So the double, um, repression gives birth to a monstrous double, is what many Victorian writers are saying. If you repress yourself so much, you will create a horrific double. And historically, we have examples of this in perhaps um, the most famous of these cases, Jack the Ripper, who apparently was said to be a respectable um, doctor by daytime and this horrific murderer um, in the evenings. And um, there was also the double life of the Victorian male in several scandals that rocked the Victorian period, such as the maiden tribute of modern Babylon, where it was exposed that you could buy uh, a young virgin in London streets for uh, a few coppers and... Um, there's also the Cleveland Street scandal, which was the uh, arrest of um, participants in a male brothel, uh, very respectable and well-heeled um, clients of this brothel, people who were very close to the royal family as well. So the secret life of the Victorian male was being exposed in literature and also in actuality in the newspapers of the day. So Lord Henry warns Dorian about the dangers of repression in that it creates a monster. He says that every impulse that we strive to strangle broods in the mind and poisons us. The only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it, resist it, and your soul grows sick with longing for the things it has befitted itself with desire for what its monstrous laws have made monstrous and unlawful. And I think this... Um, quote about monstrous laws have made monstrous and lawful is an encoded reference to the recent Criminal Law Amendment Act, which had criminalised homosexuality. But ironically, allowing yourself to do everything in the novel creates a monster out of Dorian. So even though while philosophy is uh, for a far more permissive society, curiously, this novel has this strangely moralistic ending. Here's Oscar Wilde's defence of the novel um, in the face of criticism that it was immoral. He tells us the painter Basil Hallward, worshipping physical beauty far too much, as most painters do, dies by the hand of one in whose soul he has created a monstrous and absurd vanity. Dorian Gray, having led a life of mere sensation and pleasure, tries to kill conscience. Lord Henry Wooden seeks to be merely the spectator of life. He finds that those who reject the battle are more deeply wounded than those who take part in it. Yes, there is a terrible moral in Dorian Gray, a moral which the prurient, i.e. the salacious, the people who want sort of cheap thrills, will not be able to find in it, but which will reveal to all whose minds are healthy. Is this an artistic error? I fear it is. It is the only error in the book. 
So Wang seems to be playing a double game here. It's a contradictory message. On the one hand, he's saying a desire, he get, articulates a desire for a freer society in which you don't repress your desires. On the other hand, he's saying if you live all out all your desire, you create a monster such as Dorian who destroys everything who comes uh, who comes everyone who comes into contact with him. So the larger point is that the Gothic does this. It offers us a space to dramatize and play out illicit desires, um, dramatizes the taboo, the perverse, what this society is most uh, terrified of. And it animates all this kind of crazy illicit behavior. But after being explored, this is amazingly um, immediately cut off and expurgated um, in the death of the monster. As we see, Dorian in the end cannot um, take his career any further. He's so fed up with the person that he becomes that he decides to stab the painting. And in that, he kills um, his conscience and effectively commits suicide.